interested in ways of trying to find something about the electrical conductivity, so we're still after sigma, or its reciprocal rho. And instead of doing it how we were before with uh, putting having in it, uh, a loop source with a time bearing current, we're actually going to put down a current in, into the ground. And if I have a single current that I'm injecting in, then that current is kind of going to flow uh, away, you know, sort of radially, uh, <coughs> radial outward. If I'm sitting up over here at some distance r, then there's an electric potential, a voltage that exists at that point, which is one over four pi epsilon naught. If I had it, if I had a charge Q here instead of a current, but if I had a charge Q, then it would be equal to Q upon R. And if I have a current that comes in, my voltage is rho naught i over 2 pi r. So if I imagine that I put in a, a current in, in here, then I've got a relationship for what the voltage would be if I'm sitting away sitting from it's going to be. Put my current out here, so here's But I've got a negative current that's coming up this way, so let's go ahead and have a negative voltage.
other electrode out here, and then what I can do is measure the voltage difference between these two guys. And that's going to be the voltage that I get here minus the voltage that I get there. And the result of that is going to be over It's going to be here. Let's see. So the voltage I'm going to measure between here and here is going to be the voltage I've measured from this current to here minus this current from there because that's negative current. And then with the other way around, I'm going to subtract what I've got from here onto here and here. And that's going to then give me a final values for the voltage. I'll come back to this in a second. in here gives me this guy here so now the idea is I could just measure this voltage delta V and I've got relationship between the current the resistivity and these guys are just geometric factors so sometimes we just lump those into just a constant that we call G and we call that a, a, a geometric factor and then now I can compute the the resistivity just by rearranging these things and if I would just get my voltage divided by I times G. So if the Earth was really a true homogeneous half space of resistivity rho, we'd actually get out that true value. But in fact, it's not quite that. Uh, it might be a whole bunch of, you know, sort of variable resistivity, in which case we then call this thing the apparent resistivity, just the same as we had apparent conductivity. So rho sub A is the apparent and if you're asked for a definition of that, the apparent resistivity would be the resistivity of a homogeneous Earth that gave rise to this particular measurement. So it's whatever value is re required so that when you've got that geometric factor in this, that you get uh, the correct voltage. Um, so let me regress a little bit. This was one thing that we haven't really talked about, but which you'll see in the in the lab, and also we'd like to uh, just talk about it from a from from a physical perspective. If we now think about this particular experiment that we've got, so we're going to look, let's suppose we've got some ore body underneath. This is one that was represented. This blue is a resistor up here. Uh, and then we've got uh, something out here that's con conductive and then even more conductive core. And our goal is to try to find out what this guy looks like. So we're going to do this uh, experiment where we're going to put on an electrical current at the surface. So we're going to put a positive electrode, negative electrode, so now we'd expect to see currents that are going to uh, flow through there. And those currents are going to get deviated because of the resistivity structure, just as I was showing you last time with, uh, you know, with a sphere. So we'd expect currents flow from here to there, but kind of going to flow uh, around. One of the things that's very important here, and it's kind of a physical principle that's associated with, with this, is that the electric field, if I'm trying to drive a, suppose I've got something like this, and I'm trying to drive a current through, through here, then the a, a principle that's always required is that the normal component of the current density must always be constant. So the result of that is that if I've got 
So remember the current density was equal to J times sigma, or sigma times the electric field. So if I've got something here of sigma 1, let's put sigma 1 here, sigma 2, and now I've got an electric field that's, that, 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 that's coming in here, and I've got a current density that's going to flow through. So I've got a current that's, that's going to be constant. On this side, I've got a J1, which is equal going to be sigma 1 times E1. So let's suppose I've got E1 here and a sigma 1. And on this side here, I've got J2, which is equal to sigma 2 E2. So J1 has to be equal to J2, so that normal component of current has to be the same. So if J1 is equal to sigma 2, that means that sigma 1 E1 is equal to sigma 2 E2. Okay? But if these guys are different, if sigma 1 is not equal to sigma 2, that means that E1 is not equal to E2. In other words, the electric field is discontinuous. The only way, if you remember from maybe first year physics, if you have a, a, a layer and there's a, there's a positive charge on that layer, then the electric field goes out like this from the positive charge here, and the electric field goes out like that from the positive charge here. So positive charge, every the fields uh, emanate outwards. And that means that there's a difference between the fields from one side to the other, and that depends upon whatever this charge density is. So the fact that we've got different electric fields here means that there must be charges that are, that are built up. And on this case here, we could have, have negative charges on this side, and positive charges on this side. And the establishment of those charges then gives you that connection with what is actually going to be measured uh, at the surface. Because if you remember, if you ever had a positive charge Q, then there was a voltage that was associated with that, which was 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q upon R. So I've got, if I've got any charge, that gives me an electric potential. Okay, so the procedure is that we establish, we put a current into the ground. The current sort of flows through. At regions where there's a change in the conductivity, there has to be some charges that are built up. Those charges each give rise to an electric potential that, that we can measure. And it's those, that net result, that gives rise to that number that we see uh, from the DC resistivity survey. So we put this current in here. It flows through. There's charges that are built up wherever the conductivity is changing. And then because we've got Coulomb's law, which tells us that the voltage depends upon you know, the charge elementary charges divided by the distance with the scale factor, we just sum all of these guys up and that will tell us what the potential is at each of those places and then we can measure the potential. So that's the basic physics actually. It's much simpler than the stuff that you saw previously with Maxwell's equations and in induced currents. Uh, it all effectively kind of comes down to uh, charges that are built up inside the Earth. Okay, so what do we need to, to do? Some important elements. We need to somehow <coughs> figure out what we're going to try to find. Okay, so if we're, we're, we're trying to find an object that, that, that looks like this. Then we've got to put our currents sort of into the ground in such a way that they're going to couple with, with the object. So we need to have currents that, that are flowing through. Once I got those currents, it sets up charges. And then the voltage 
So you can imagine targets are set up here. And then now I have to measure with some kind of an instrument sort of what that voltage difference is. So I'm going to try to position those electrodes so that I get a number that's, that's fairly big. Okay, so this I think we we saw we've just done in the app in in the lab. This is the characteristic figure that you had. You have positive current here, negative current here. So the voltage from this positive current kind of goes up like that, and the negative current goes up like that, and then we measure some voltage difference between any of those two uh, two parts. And then we can use that to calculate an apparent uh, resistivity. Something that uh, I think is intuitive. Suppose that I've got a, a layer. I've got a sigma one here and a, and a sigma two here. And now. So the, the, the idea is that you want to put in, you know, some kind of a current through here that is, is going to recognize that you've got a boundary under here. So maybe this is bedrock or just some, some other layer. If you're in a situation like this, so basically the kind of the current sort of flow through like this, and because you're the spacings between your uh, curved electrodes are perhaps much less than what we've got here, you can kind of get the idea that virtually all the current is going to flow in this upper region, which means that you're only going to be sensitive to, to what's going on here. So if you plotted the apparent conductivity, or maybe here I could have used resistivity, If we do a measurement of the electric potential in, in here, then the apparent resistivity I'm going to get is basically just going to be due to this, this guy here. And so I'm going to look at some value here. So this is that's row one. And now if I let's suppose I keep that same geometry, but I just make it progressively bigger. So I could start, here's my A, B, M, M, and I'm, I'm going to think about this whole thing being compressed or gradually made bigger and bigger. And so I could put on a sort of a scale length here for, for, for my survey. And so I could plot scale length here. When my scale length is actually much less than whatever this thickness is. Let's call it H. So maybe that's H here. When we're much less than that, my apparent resistivities are probably going to be pretty close to row one. If, however, I make this thing really big, so if I plot it <laughs> on a different scale, so that effectively, you know, my this layer of thickness looks like this. And now my currents are at this this kind of size. Then you, you might get the idea. Well, this layer thickness here is so small that we're not really even seeing it. So basically, all the currents are kind of flowing in here. And that for scale lengths that are really big, I'm actually going to come up to something that's more like rho two. In between, you might kind of think that that curve would look like this. So that's exactly what happens. I mean, I think you might have sort of got that just sort of from an intuitive viewpoint. But if you uh, actually carried out the numbers, you'd see that the same, that, that same thing happens. If, you, if your sampling array is really small compared to the depth that you're interested in, then you're just going to be sensitive to this if it's large than that. I'm not sure that you can see that. Does that help? 
when you look at the uh, at the GPG, you'll, you'll be able to see. So this is that kind of electrode spacing, and this is the apparent resistivity. And when you're really small, you start out at the upper layer, and then you gradually get down to, to, to the bottom layer. So there's a whole host of ways that you can acquire data, and you'll see different names for different types of surveys. A lot of these have a degree of symmetry that's, that's attached to them. Uh, this one, for instance, has got four electrodes, and they're each the same distance apart. So I've got a current electrode, and then some distance A, I've got a potential electrode, so here's A, M, N, B, and all of these are distance A apart, and that's just a configuration that people have taken data for years, so you're going to see that name, and it's called a Wenner array. Uh, the other kind of thing, array that you'll see is something called a Schlumberger array, which is kind of like this, except these electrodes here, the M and the N, that distance here between M and N is actually much less than the A, B, so R, M. And is much less than R. So it's it, it's still an electrode array that's symmetrical about some some midpoint, but for whatever reason, you know, they chose to have these two things actually fairly close together. So that's a winner and, and a Schlumberger. And you'll see these a lot. Um, sometimes environmental surveys will tend to, to emphasize these. And the way they operate is in something called a sounding mode. And that's basically to pick a point. So you could pick, you could probably do it in here. So you pick a point here, and then you start with the array compressed, and then you just gradually get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And effectively what you're doing is kind of expanding around some central point, and then you can plot an apparent resistivity as a function of your scale length of, of your array, and then you get some kind of a curve maybe that, uh, that, that looks like this. And the idea with this sounding is that your, your, your kind of central point of your array is, is right here, and you're just gradually making it bigger and bigger, and as you do, then the currents go farther, and you're somehow looking deeper so as you if in increased size, you're looking deeper, but you're kind of thinking it being directed. So that's the first thing is, you know, and if things were really one dimensional, then that's really all you'd need, right? You just <laughs> sit someplace and just expand and you're kind of good to go. But in many cases, what we're looking for is something that's varying laterally. So suppose we've got some, some, some object in, in here. Then as you, as you sort of move over here, what you're trying to do is to try to find this, th this guy. And so you, you might try the, the, the following thing is like, okay, let's fix an electrode array. I suppose I took something this, so here's my A, B, and I'll take this and I'll, I'll put it here, I'll get a number, put it here, dot, 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 and then I'd look to see what the apparent resistivities were as I go over here, and the apparent resistivities, you know, might be up here, and then as I go over, it drops down, and it comes like this. So this is now distance out this way, and I'm simply just taking my array and, and moving it over. That would be called a profile. So I'm, I've got my array and I'm just moving it over across like this. You know, and if there's some parts that are particularly conductive or resistive, I might see some inflection. 
So that's good for lateral changes. But there might be cases where you kind of want to do both, because if I fix my if I fix my array, here's my currents, here's my potentials, there's there, there's kind of a depth of investigation that's associated with this particular array. There's a there's a, there's a sensitivity down at at, at some depth. And if the object that I'm looking for happens to be in there, I'm, that's great. But if my object is down here, or if it's smaller and up there, then it might be that that array is not actually a really good one to use. So in that case, what I'd like to do is to hedge my bets a little bit and say, well, I'm going to go over with one type of array in a profiling zone. And then I'm going to take a different, I'm going to take a different array, maybe compressed or wider, and, and also pull it over. So that would combine then the two aspects of the sounding and the profile. And if you look to see how people are acquiring data these days, that's basically what they're what, what they're doing. So first of all, to, to talk about the profiling, again, a whole bunch of different types of uh, electrodes. So this one is called a pole pole. And of course, you always need to have four electrodes. But if I've got an area of interest, so let's suppose my area of interest is like this. And I take my A electrode. And then I run my so here's my generator. And then I put my B electrode way in and gone someplace. And then if I had my M electrode for my potential, and I put my N electrode way in heck and gone, then really the only thing that I'm kind of considering about is basically just a current pole electrode and a pole potential electrode. So that gives us uh, a pole pole. Okay. You also have a pole dipole. In fact, this is the one that is is very often used in, in mineral exploration. Uh, so we'll take run the A or this other current electrode out oh, heck and gone. And instead of doing this, now for our potential electrodes, we've got an M and, and an N and we'll, we'll use that. <laughs> and I sometimes use dipole dipole. This is actually uh, more heavily used in kind of environmental types of, uh, of, of, of surveys. The reason for that is for the pole, pole, you deepest amount of penetration, you have the smallest resolution. Uh, for the dipole, dipole, you sort of have the shallowest amount of, uh, <coughs> of uh, depth information, but the highest resolution, and these guys are kind of in, in between. So those would be the profiling modes. And because, as I just said, what we'd often want to do is to do both of these things together, uh, to do both profiling and sounding, then what we're going to do is decide on an array. So it could be a pole-pole, or it could be pole-dipole, whatever. And then we're going to move it along. So that's the profiling. And then we're going to expand things, make it bigger. So that's the sounding. So we put them all together. And we end up with something that looks like this. So this, this is kind of how we do it. We have a, uh, a current source. And generally, we take the, the, the current, and instead of just turning it on and leaving it, we do the follow. We turn it on, and we leave it for a while. Then we turn it off. And so what, while this is happening, my, my voltage here when the current is off is, is gone. So this is I. So this is time along this axis. My voltage down here is nothing when, the, when there's no current. The moment the current goes on, now I get some voltage. <coughs> Leave that on. And then at some point, I'm going to turn the current off. 
goes, so it goes down like this. So my voltage signal looks like this. And then I'm going to leave this off for a while. And then I'm going to turn it back on, but in the opposite polarity, and then be like this. We'll talk a little bit more about exactly why we do this. This is because of this IP experiment that I'm going to talk about. But this would be sort of the nature of the current that you put in, and the voltage then you'd expect would with would, would, would anyway. So for each of these voltages that you, that you get, we could compute that to some apparent resistivity. So we've got we've got the voltage, we've got the currents, we know what all the geometry is. So that gives us an apparent resistivity. When we're going out and doing an experiment, we've got sort of a start position of our survey, end position. We're, we're looking for, for, for something in here. We've got whatever, maybe it's a pole dipole or something, the experiment. And we're going to move this along and we're also going to expand it so that means that we need to have some way of uh, at least plotting up the data and the way the data are going to be plotted is something called a pseudo section and i want to explain how that is so here's here's our system so we've got currents, we've got potentials. So we can measure that potential, delta V. We know what the current is. We know what the geometry is. So that gives us an apparent resistivity. OK, got that. We'd actually like to plot that somehow. So we can imagine that we're going to make a plotting plane. And let's suppose we've got a dipole-dipole survey. And the way we choose to do this is that we will draw a, a diagonal line, 45 degrees, from the current dipole, and then 45 degrees from the potential dipole, and have where they intersect, that's actually where I'm going to plot the data. So I'm going to plot an apparent resistivity value in a plotting plane right there. If I then move this away what happens to the plotting value well we still have we're still along this 45 degree angle we're still along this one but now they are going to join here so the farther these guys move away the deeper in the plotting plane the, the number is, is plotted so you kind of kind of see how this is going to go right but the, the farther this moves away i'm going to get to be able to plot the data in a way that at least as i go down here I'm going to be thinking somehow I'm going down in depth. So this is not going to be a true depth. It's just going to be kind of representative. But you sort of hope that maybe things will give you some inkling of what's there geologically, or at least as a way of plotting the data. So now we continue to do that. So you gradually get that. OK, so that would that would be that. So now we could imagine, here's, here's our whole survey. So you can see what's happening here. So we continue to move the, A, the current electrodes. And then this guy, the potential electrodes, continues to, to move out. And each time we sort of plot the, 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 the values, we've got the apparent resistivities. And then we can contour them up so that the reds are regions of low resistivity and the blues are regions of, of high resistivity. So let's just do that again. Okay, so you can see what's happened here. Uh, this has moved over one unit. This has actually moved over quite a few. Now we have 45 degree angles over here and So there we go here. So you can see we're gradually building up our plot. Right, so now all of these are, are, are just values. And then once we get to the end of the plot, we 
contour it up. So for people, how many people have actually seen a pseudo section? One, just one? No, one, not that. Uh, so for anybody who's done a DCIP experiment, then this is generally, at least traditionally, the way the data are plotted. At least that's in surveys in which the data are collected uh, along a line. So your currents and potential electrodes are, are, are all the same. That was a plot of the data. What I want to emphasize is that there, even, even when we talked about that sort of, sort of sphere, right, and so we got a current that comes in here, so we got currents that are kind of going like this, and I said, well, you know, that's going to give us sort of charges up here and maybe other charges down here. Each of those contributes to, you know, some potential up here. And at the end of the day, we're going to take that number and we're going to get one apparent resistivity, 120 ohm meters, and we're going to plot that at some particular point. That plot does not specify that at this particular depth, at this particular location, it's 120 ohm meters. It's, it's just a plot. The number that you get really depends upon everything that's happening in the volume. And in fact, that's one of the things that characterizes a lot of geophysical data. We get a number out, but really the understanding of that number means that you have to understand where currents or charges are everywhere in the subsurface. So it's just a number. Similarly, when you put all that together, this image of the data that, that you have here is just a picture. That picture might tell you something geologically. In this case, it does, actually. So here's a case where we've got a buried prism. Okay. So this is a conductive prism in a more resistive background. This dipole, dipole experiment over top of here, we'd actually get this pseudo section that looks like this. Well, this doesn't look like that, but you know, it's got some things that are associated, but like the high, um, high conductivity or low resistivity is kind of centered right around here, which is more or less where the center of the block is. And you know, for a trained eye, somebody's had a little bit of experience and you're going to spot a drill hole, uh, you'd look at this and say, oh, I'm going to just spot something right in here. I think there's something right underneath. In which case, had you done that, you'd have been quite successful. The thing I want to emphasize is that when you just take this background geology and you start just start putting little bits of junk in, sort of maybe some clays and, you know, good graphites or whatever. It's just you know, little bits of crud up top. And then you do the same experiment. You now get a DC resistivity pseudosection that looks like this. So now this is completely uninterpretable. You can't, you simply can't do anything with this. It's just stuff that's happening because of all of that ground. So you've gone to all this work, you collected the data, you got a picture of the data, but it doesn't tell you anything. And again, remember that you know, each point that you actually have here is just a reflection of everything that is existing in that whole region. So here is a case now where you, you absolutely have no choice, but you've got to do something that's more sophisticated. So now you actually have to invert these data. So we don't, unfortunately, have very much time to talk about this, but I'll give you a, a quick so basically what we're doing, we've got our measurements, got some data, and the purpose of the inversion is that we want to somehow go back and try to find what that Earth model was. So in this case, we want to find that electrical conductivity. In order to do that, we actually have to do a whole workflow. Everything from 
you know, collecting the data, understanding what the data are, the uncertainties. We're going to have to discretize the Earth, divide it up into a whole bunch of little blocks. And then we're going to have to adjust the values of those blocks so that we actually go ahead and, and, and fit, the, fit the data. So the process is involved, but, but doable. And if we go ahead and now take a look at this example, our resistivity. This was our pseudo section, doesn't mean anything. But if we take that and we put it into an inversion, then we get out something that looks like this. So it's actually got a lot of really good features to it, right? So here's, here is our block that we're interested in. Well, it doesn't have sharp boundaries, it's kind of smooth, but that's okay. I and mean, if you drilled here, you'd, you'd get this. And the other thing is that all this junk that was sitting out here, we've actually recovered it. So the inversion has kind of recovered the locations of that, of, of those other pieces of, of conducting material. So we can do that. And now that processing not only needs to be done, but is standardly done. In most cases, the, uh, the Earth, I showed you there was, was uh, sort of 2D examples. In, in real cases now, you have to contend with the fact that the Earth is, is 3D. So we've got all kinds of topography done. The objects under the ground might be sheets or dikes or, or, or something like this. And so you've actually got to do this in 3D. And so I want to show you one, one example. So this was stuff that was done from uh, uh, Australia a number of years ago. So the area, this was a mineral deposit. So this is about two and a half kilometers on this axis here. And this is about four kilometers here. And what we're looking at are 10 lines of data. So each of these lines of data, there was a, a pole-dipole experiment. So one end of the current wire was run a couple of kilometers off the end here. And so we had a pole, and then we measured the electric potentials along these lines here. And what you're seeing here are the pseudo sections that I was just talking about on each of these lines with the following geometry, which is a dipole pole, which means that the electric potentials were on this side, and the current source was, was on here. Red is indicates uh, low resistivity or high conductivity. And so you can see that, oh, there's, there is some stuff happening here as I go through these different lines. There's, there's some red, red things here. Right? So it's telling you something, but that doesn't give you a geologic picture. So if you excited the Earth differently, and we could do that simply by reversing the whole situation. I could put the current electrode on here. So now I'm igniting the Earth differently because my currents are coming in from this direction. And I get these pseudosections. Now you've seen pseudosections have changed a lot. There's still something kind of red over on this side, and there's things that are more blue. But that doesn't do a, it doesn't give you a geologic understanding of, of what's going on. So we've got all of these pictures, and we need to somehow combine them to get a single, there's only one Earth model out there, so what we want to do is somehow combine all those images and uh, see if we can find something that's geologic. So we do that. So now what we do is we take those as data, and then we take this mathematical cube for the model. We take an Earth model, divide it up into a whole bunch of cells, hundreds of thousands or millions of cells, and then we adjust the values of these cells through the inversion so that we fit all of these data and at the same time find something that's kind of reasonably smooth. And we do that, we get a cube. So what I'm going to show you now is <clears throat> it's uh, a three-dimensional cube that has been color coded so that the red means that the numbers are, the cell values are really conductive. Oops. And what we're going to do now is slice through this guy in a couple of different directions. So now we're slicing from <clears throat> the south to the north, and then we're going to kind of come back again. And you can see as we do that, there's the prominent thing is this red block up here. 
And now we're going to slice from the top down. And you can see, again, there's this big red guy here. So that's, that's going to be a big conductor that's going to come out. And now what's happening is the cube is spinning, but as it spins, the isosurface at which things become transparent get progressively changed so that at the end, we're only going to see the most conductive parts of that whole 3D model. And in the end, it looks like this. So here is your three-dimensional image of the geology that was underground that actually produced those data. At least this is the biggest element here. So this element is actually a, uh, a, a black shale unit. It's very conductive, and it's by far the most dominant, uh, dominant component for establishing what the signal is for that that, that DC resistivity surveys. So that's the good news. We've taken all of those pseudo sections and we've manipulated them into getting something that's, that, that's geologic. Uh, the bad news in this case is that what they were actually looking for was a mineral deposit. And this guy is not mineralized. He's not anything that's particularly useful. However, this same experiment that I just talked about, where we had a current that goes in like this. So here was my current. There's a companion experiment, while well, it's done at the same time, in which instead of just measuring this number here and getting the apparent resistivities, you actually look at what happens after the current turns off. So when this current turns off, it turns out that there's going to be a decay voltage here. That decay voltage is indicative of the fact that the Earth can actually charge up. It has some charge ability. And that gives rise to another datum, which is called the IP datum, or induced polarization datum. So what I'm going to do next time, I'm going to pick it up from, from here. We're going to talk about this part of the curve that comes down, how it is, what causes it, and how we can extract information about the Earth from it. And this guy here turns out to be one of the most, I think, important aspects of mineral exploration that's probably cropped up in the last you know, 30 or, or, or 40 years. Certainly, anybody who's got a porphyry deposit, something like that, uh, would definitely uh, be associated with. Anyway, so that's where we'll pick it up uh, on Wednesday. Thanks.